Chapter 12 of Tales from Sketches of Boz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens. Illustrations by George Cruikshank. Chapter 12 of Tales The Drunkard's Death. We will be bold to say that there is scarcely a man in the constant habit of walking day after day through any of the crowded thoroughfares of London who cannot recollect among the people whom he knows by sight, to use a familiar phrase, some being of abject and wretched appearance whom he remembers to have seen in a very different condition, whom he has observed sinking lower and lower by almost imperceptible degrees, and the shabbiness and utter destitution of whose appearance at last strike forcibly and painfully upon him as he passes by. Is there any man who has mixed much with society, or whose avocations have caused him to mingle, at one time or other, with a great number of people, who cannot call to mind the time when some shabby, miserable wretch, in rags and filth, who shuffles past him now in all the squalor of disease and poverty, with a respectable tradesman or clerk, or a man following some thriving pursuit with good prospects and decent means? Or cannot any of our readers call to mind from among the list of their quondam acquaintance some fallen and degraded man who lingers about the pavement in hungry misery, from whom every one turns coldly away, and who preserves himself from sheer starvation nobody knows how? Alas, such cases are of too frequent occurrence to be rare items in any man's experience, and but too often arise from one cause, drunkenness, that fierce rage for the slow, sure poison that oversteps every other consideration, that casts aside wife, children, friends, happiness and station, and hurries its victims madly on to degradation and death. Some of these men have been impelled by misfortune and misery to the vice that has degraded them, the ruin of worldly expectations, the death of those they loved, the sorrow that slowly consumes but will not break the heart, has driven them wild, and they present the hideous spectacle of madmen, slowly dying by their own hands. But by far the greater part have willfully, and with open eyes, plunged into the gulf from which the man who once enters it never rises more, but into which he sinks deeper and deeper down, until recovery is hopeless. Such a man as this once stood by the bedside of his dying wife, while his children knelt around, and mingled loud bursts of grief with their innocent prayers. The room was scantily and meanly furnished, and it needed but a glance at the pale form from which the light of life was fast passing away to know that grief and want and anxious care had been busy at the heart for many a weary year. An elderly woman, with her face bathed in tears, was supporting the head of the dying woman, her daughter, on her arm. But it was not towards her that the face was turned. It was not her hand that the cold and trembling fingers clasped. They pressed the husband's arm, the eyes so soon to be closed in death, rested on his face, and the man shook beneath their gaze. His dress was slovenly and disordered, 
his face inflamed, his eyes bloodshot and heavy. He had been summoned from some wild debauch to the bed of sorrow and death. A shaded lamp by the bedside cast a dim light on the figures around, and left the remainder of the room in thick, deep shadow. The silence of night prevailed without the house, and the stillness of death was in the chamber. A watch hung over the mantel shelf. Its low ticking was the only sound that broke the profound quiet, but it was a solemn one for well they knew who heard it that before it had recorded the passing of another hour it would beat the knell of a departed spirit it is a dreadful thing to wait and watch for the approach of death to know that hope is gone and recovery impossible and to sit and count the dreary hours through long long nights such nights as only watchers by the bed of sickness know it chills the blood to hear the dearest secrets of the heart the pent-up hidden secrets of many years poured forth by the unconscious helpless being before you and to think how little the reserve and cunning of a whole life will avail when fever and delirium tear off the mask at last strange tales have been told in the wanderings of dying men tales so full of guilt and crime that those who stood by the sick person's couch have fled in horror and affright lest they should be scared to madness by what they heard and saw and many a wretch has died alone raving of deeds the very name of which has driven the boldest man away but no such ravings were to be heard at the bedside by which the children knelt their half-stifled sobs and moaning alone broke the silence of the lonely chamber and when at last the mother's grasp relaxed and turning one look from the children to the father she vainly strove to speak and fell backward on the pillow all was so calm and tranquil that she seemed to sink to sleep they leant over her they called upon her name softly at first and then in the loud and piercing tones of desperation but there was no reply they listened for her breath but no sound came they felt for the palpitation of the heart but no faint throb responded to the touch that heart was broken and she was dead the husband sunk into a chair by the bedside and clasped his hands upon his burning forehead he gazed from child to child but when a weeping eye met his he quailed beneath its look no word of comfort was whispered in his ear no look of kindness lighted on his face all shrunk from and avoided him and when at last he staggered from the room no one sought to follow or console the widower the time had been when many a friend would have crowded round him in his affliction and many a heartfelt condolence would have met him in his grief where were they now one by one friends relations the commonest acquaintance even had fallen off from and deserted the drunkard his wife alone had clung to him in good and evil in sickness and poverty and how had he rewarded her he had reeled from the tavern to her bedside in time to see her die he rushed from the house and walked swiftly through the streets remorse fear shame all crowded on his mind stupefied with drink and bewildered with the scene he had just witnessed he re-entered the tavern he had quitted shortly before glass succeeded glass his blood mounted and his brain whirled round death every one must die and why not she she was too good for him her relations had often told him so curses on them had they not deserted her and left her to whine away the time at home 
well she was dead and happy perhaps it was better as it was another glass one more hurrah it was a merry life while it lasted and he would make the most of it time went on the three children who were left to him grew up and were children no longer the father remained the same poorer shabbier and more dissolute looking but the same confirmed and irreclaimable drunkard the boys had long ago run wild in the streets and left him the girl alone remained but she worked hard and words or blows could always procure him something for the tavern so he went on in the old course and a merry life he led one night as early as ten o'clock for the girl had been sick for many days and there was consequently little to spend at the public house he bent his steps homeward bethinking himself that if he would have her able to earn money it would be as well to apply to the parish surgeon or at all events to take the trouble of inquiring what ailed her which he had not yet thought it worth while to do it was a wet december night the wind blew piercing cold and the rain poured heavily down he begged a few halfpence from a passer-by and having bought a small loaf for it was his interest to keep the girl alive if he could he shuffled onwards as fast as the wind and rain would allow him at the back of fleet street and lying between it and the waterside are several mean and narrow courts which form a portion of whitefriars it was to one of these that he directed his steps the alley into which he turned might for filth and misery have competed with the darkest corner of this ancient sanctuary in its dirtiest and most lawless time the houses varying from two stories in height to four were stained with every indescribable hue that long exposure to the weather damp and rottenness can impart to tenements composed originally of the roughest and coarsest materials the windows were patched with paper and stuffed with the foulest rags the doors were falling from their hinges poles with lines on which to dry clothes projected from every casement and sounds of quarrelling or drunkenness issued from every room the solitary oil lamp in the centre of the court had been blown out either by the violence of the wind or the act of some inhabitant who had excellent reasons for objecting to his residence being rendered too conspicuous and the only light which fell upon the broken and uneven pavement was derived from the miserable candles that here and there twinkled in the rooms of such of the more fortunate residents as could afford to indulge in so expensive a luxury a gutter ran down the centre of the alley all the sluggish odours of which had been called forth by the rain and as the wind whistled through the old houses the doors and shutters creaked upon their hinges and the windows shook in their frames with a violence which every moment seemed to threaten the destruction of the whole place the man whom we have followed into this den walked on in the darkness sometimes stumbling into the main gutter and at others into some branch repositories of garbage which had been formed by the rain until he reached the last house in the court the door or rather what was left of it stood ajar for the convenience of the numerous lodgers and he proceeded to grope his way up the old and broken stair to the attic story he was within a step or two of his room door when it opened and a girl whose miserable and emaciated appearance was only to be equalled by that of the candle which she shaded with her hand peeped anxiously out is that you father said the girl who else should it be replied the man gruffly what are you trembling at 
it's little enough that i've had to drink today for there's no drink without money and no money without work what the devil's the matter with the girl i am not well father not at all well said the girl bursting into tears ah replied the man in the tone of a person who is compelled to admit a very unpleasant fact to which he would rather remain blind if he could you must get better somehow for we must have money you must go to the parish doctor and make him give you some medicine they're paid for it damn em what are you standing before the door for let me come in can't you father whispered the girl shutting the door behind her and placing herself before it william has come back oh said the man with a start hush replied the girl william brother william and what does he want said the man with an effort at composure money meat drink he's come to the wrong shop for that if he does give me the candle give me the candle fool i ain't gonna hurt him he snatched the candle from her hand and walked into the room sitting on an old box with his head resting on his hand and his eyes fixed on a wretched cinder fire that was smouldering on the hearth was a young man of about two and twenty miserably clad in an old coarse jacket and trousers he started up when his father entered fasten the door mary said the young man hastily fasten the door you look as if you didn't know me father it's long enough since you drove me from home you may well forget me and what do you want here now said the father sitting himself on a stool on the other side of the fireplace what do you want here now shelter replied the son i'm in trouble that's enough if i'm caught i shall swing that's certain caught i shall be unless i stop here that's as certain and there's an end of it you mean to say you've been robbing or murdering then said the father yes i do replied the son does it surprise you father he looked steadily in the man's face but he withdrew his eyes and bent them on the ground where's your brothers he said after a long pause where they'll never trouble you replied his son john's gone at america and henry's dead dead said the father with a shudder which even he could not express dead replied the young man he died in my arms shot like a dog by a gamekeeper he staggered back i caught him and his blood trickled down my hands it poured out from his side like water he was weak and it blinded him but he threw himself down on his knees on the grass and prayed at god that if his mother was in heaven he would hear her prayers for pardon for her youngest son it was a favourite boy will he said and i am glad to think now that when she was dying though i was a very young child then and my little heart was almost bursting i knelt down at the foot of the bed and thanked god for having made me so fond of her as to have never once done anything to bring the tears into her eyes oh will why was she taken away and father left there's his dying words father said the young man make the best you can of em you struck him across the face in a drunken fit the morning we ran away and here's the end of it the girl wept aloud and the father sinking his head upon his knees rocked himself to and fro if i am taken said the young man i shall be carried back into the country and hung for that man's murder they cannot trace me here without your assistance father for all i know you may give me up to justice but unless you do here i stop 
until I can venture to escape abroad. For two whole days, all three remained in the wretched room without stirring out. On the third evening, however, the girl was worse than she had been yet, and the few scraps of food they had were gone. It was indispensably necessary that somebody should go out, and as the girl was too weak and ill, the father went just at nightfall. He got some medicine for the girl, and a trifle in the way of pecuniary assistance. On his way back, he earned sixpence by holding a horse, and he turned homewards with enough money to supply their most pressing wants for two or three days to come. He had to pass the public house. He lingered for an instant, walked past it, turned back again, lingered once more, and finally slunk in. Two men, whom he had not observed, were on the watch. They were on the point of giving up their search in despair when his loitering attracted their attention, and when he entered the public house, they followed him. "'You'll drink with me, master,' said one of them, proffering him a glass of liquor. "'And me too,' said the other, replenishing the glass as soon as it was drained of its contents. The man thought of his hungry children and his son's danger, but they were nothing to the drunkard. He did drink, and his reason left him. "'A wet night, warden,' whispered one of the men in his ear, as he at length turned to go away, after spending in liquor one half of the money on which, perhaps, his daughter's life depended. "'The right sort of night for our friends in hiding, Master Warden,' whispered the other. "'Sit down here,' said the one who had spoken first, drawing him into a corner. "'We have been looking out of the young un. We came a tell him. It's all right now. But we couldn't find him, cause we hadn't got the precise direction. But that ain't strange, for I don't think he knowed it himself when he come to London, did he?' "'No, he didn't,' replied the father. The two men exchanged glances. "'There's a vessel down at the docks to sail at midnight when it's high water,' resumed the first speaker, "'and we'll put him on board. "'His passage is taken in another name, "'and what's better than that, it's paid for. "'It's lucky we met you.' "'Very,' said the second. "'Capital luck.' said the first with a wink to his companion. Great, replied the second with a slight nod of intelligence. Another glass here, quick, said the first speaker, and in five minutes more the father had unconsciously yielded up his own son into the hangman's hands. Slowly and heavily the time dragged along as the brother and sister in their miserable hiding place listened in anxious suspense to the slightest sound. At length, a heavy footstep was heard upon the stair. It approached nearer, it reached the landing, and the father staggered into the room. The girl saw that he was intoxicated, and advanced with the candle in her hand to meet him. She stopped short, gave a loud scream, and fell senseless on the ground. She had caught sight of the shadow of a man reflected on the floor. They both rushed in, and in another instant the young man was a prisoner, and handcuffed. Very quietly done, said one of the men to his companion, thanks to the old man. Lift up the girl, Tom. Come, come, it's no use crying, young woman. It's all over now and can't be helped. The young man stooped for an instant over the girl, and then turned fiercely round upon his father, who had reeled against the wall, and was gazing on the group with drunken stupidity. Listen to me, father, he said in a tone that made the drunkard's flesh creep. My brother's blood and mine is on your head. I never had kind look or word or care from you and alive or dead i never will forgive you die when you will or how i will be with you 
I speak as a dead man now, and I warn you, father, that as surely as you must one day stand before your maker, so surely shall your children be there, and in end to cry for judgment against you. He raised his manacled hands in a threatening attitude, fixed his eyes on his shrinking parent, and slowly left the room and neither father nor sister ever beheld him more on this side of the grave when the dim and misty light of a winter's morning penetrated into the narrow court and struggled through the begrimed window of the wretched room warden awoke from his heavy sleep and found himself alone he rose and looked round him the old flock mattress on the floor was undisturbed everything was just as he remembered to have seen it last and there were no signs of any one save himself having occupied the room during the night he inquired of the other lodgers and of the neighbours but his daughter had not been seen or heard of he rambled through the streets and scrutinized each wretched face among the crowds that thronged them with anxious eyes but his search was fruitless and he returned to his garret when night came on desolate and weary for many days he occupied himself in the same manner but no trace of his daughter did he meet with and no word of her reached his ears at length he gave up the pursuit as hopeless he had long thought of the probability of her leaving him and endeavouring to gain her bread in quiet elsewhere she had left him at last to starve alone he ground his teeth and cursed her he begged his bread from door to door every halfpenny he could wring from the pity or credulity of those to whom he addressed himself was spent in the old way a year passed over his head the roof of a jail was the only one that had sheltered him for many months he slept under archways and in brickfields anywhere where there was some warmth or shelter from the cold and rain but in the last stage of poverty disease and houseless want he was a drunkard still at last one bitter night he sunk down on a doorstep faint and ill the premature decay of vice and profligacy had worn him to the bone his cheeks were hollow and livid his eyes were sunken and their sight was dim his legs trembled beneath his weight and a cold shiver ran through every limb and now the long-forgotten scenes of a misspent life crowded thick and fast upon him he thought of the time when he had a home a happy cheerful home and of those who peopled it and flocked about him then until the forms of his elder children seemed to rise from the grave and stand about him so plain so clear and so distinct they were that he could touch and feel them looks that he had long forgotten were fixed upon him once more voices long since hushed in death sounded in his ears like the music of village bells but it was only for an instant and cold and hunger were gnawing at his heart again he rose and dragged his feeble limbs a few paces further the street was silent and empty the few passengers who passed by at that late hour hurried quickly on and his tremulous voice was lost in the violence of the storm again the heavy chill struck through his frame and his blood seemed to stagnate beneath it he coiled himself up in a projecting doorway and tried to sleep but sleep had fled from his dull and glazed eyes his mind wandered strangely but he was awake and conscious the well-known shout of drunken mirth sounded in his ear the glass was at his lips the board was covered with choice rich food they were before him he could see them all 
he had but to reach out his hand and take them, and, though the illusion was reality itself, he knew that he was sitting alone in the deserted street, watching the raindrops as they pattered on the stones, that death was coming upon him by inches, and that there were none to care for or help him. Suddenly he started up, in the extremity of terror, he had heard his own voice shouting in the night air. He knew not what or why. Hark! A groan! Another! His senses were leaving him. Half-formed and incoherent words burst from his lips, and his hands sought to tear and lacerate his flesh. He was going mad, and he shrieked for help till his voice failed him. He raised his head and looked up the long dismal street he recollected that outcasts like himself condemned to wander day and night in those dreadful streets had sometimes gone distracted with their own loneliness he remembered to have heard many years before that a homeless wretch had once been found in a solitary corner sharpening a rusty knife to plunge into his own heart preferring death to that endless weary wandering to and fro in an instant his resolve was taken his limbs received new life he ran quickly from the spot and paused not for breath until he reached the riverside he crept softly down the steep stone stairs that lead from the commencement of waterloo bridge down to the water's level he crouched into a corner and held his breath as the patrol passed never did prisoner's heart throb with the hope of liberty and life half so eagerly as did that of the wretched man at the prospect of death the watch passed close to him but he remained unobserved and after waiting till the sound of footsteps had died away in the distance he cautiously descended and stood beneath the gloomy arch that forms the landing place from the river the tide was in and the water flowed at his feet the rain had ceased the wind was lulled and all was for the moment still and quiet so quiet that the slightest sound on the opposite bank even the rippling of the water against the barges that were moored there was distinctly audible to his ear the stream stole languidly and sluggishly on strange and fantastic forms rose to the surface and beckoned him to approach dark gleaming eyes peered from the water and seemed to mock his hesitation while hollow murmurs from behind urged him onwards he retreated a few paces took a short run desperate leap and plunged into the river not five seconds had passed when he rose to the water's surface but what a change had taken place in that short time in all his thoughts and feelings life life in any form poverty misery starvation anything but death he fought and struggled with the water that closed over his head and screamed in agonies of terror the curse of his own son rang in his ears the shore but one foot of dry ground he could almost touch the step one hand's breadth nearer and he was saved but the tide bore him onward under the dark arches of the bridge and he sank to the bottom again he rose and struggled for life for one instant for one brief instant the buildings on the river's banks the lights on the bridge through which the current had borne him the black water and the fast flying clouds were distinctly visible once more he sunk and once again he rose bright flames of fire shot up from earth to heaven and reeled before his eyes while the water thundered in his ears and stunned him with its furious roar a week afterwards the body was washed ashore some miles down the river a swollen and disfigured mass 
unrecognized and unpitied it was borne to the grave and there it has long since moulded away end of chapter 12 of tales from sketches by boz recording by nicholas james bridgewater recorded in london england end of sketches by boz by charles dickens